When people ask me what my favorite movie genre is, my response is always horror. Unfortunately, horror doesn't always have the best reputation, as it is a genre filled with quite a bit of garbage, films relying on cheap gimmicks and repetitive formulas. But when a horror film is truly great, its effects can be felt for years, if not decades. William Friedkin's The Exorcist is undoubtedly one of those films, up there with some of the very best the genre has to offer. The Exorcist is often marketed as the scariest movie of all time, and while that's certainly debatable, it's not a bad film to carry that mantle. After all, some of the most intense audience reactions ever in the history of cinema came in 1973 from this movie. Many people fainting and vomiting in the theater, probably to things like this, or this, or this. But there was always one scene that stood out to me, one that unsettled me more than anything else in the film. It's a scene that I don't see getting talked about much, probably because of all the insanity in the third act, which is what most people remember. But part of the reason why the insanity of the third act works so well is because of all that comes before it. And one scene that comes before it is Damien Karras' nightmare. Karras is a man who first became a priest and later became a psychiatrist, now working both occupations simultaneously. However, because of his medical knowledge, his faith has waned considerably. I need reassignment, Tom. I want out of this job. It's wrong. It's no good. Some of their problems come down to faith, their vocation, the meaning of their lives, and I can't cut it anymore. As a result, he feels like a fraud, a man woefully unfit to perform his duties as a priest. I think I've lost my faith, Tom. To make matters worse, he also struggles with deep guilt in regards to his mother, who lived in poor health and died alone as Damien was unable to care for her due to distance and financial constraints. It's my mother, Tom. She's alone, I never should have left her. At least in New York, I'd be near her, I'd be close to her. All of these thoughts and emotions are crippling Karis, and the evil in the film knows it. He tries to get some sleep in hopes of any kind of temporary peace, but he gets anything but that. All right, there was a lot going on there, so let's take a closer look. Firstly, the brief flash of the demon is a clear indication that the demon has invaded Karis' subconscious, which is why it knows of his mother's death and taunts Karis with that information later in the film. Don't listen. Why, Dimi? We also hear Karis' breathing throughout the dream, which is not only creepy, but it suggests that we are viewing this dream from a perspective other than Karis's, one that is outside of him. I mean, do you hear your own breathing when you dream? Whether the demon is just observing Karis's dream or is actively influencing it is up to the viewer, but I might guess the latter because of this shot right here. Why a subway station? It seems to be a representation of her descending into hell, being pulled down by the demon. Perhaps Karis couldn't save her from evil because of his loss of faith, as depicted here with the following medallion necklace of St. Joseph with baby Jesus, the same necklace Karis wears around his neck near the end of the film when he has regained his faith, and the same necklace that is then ripped off of him before he lets the demon in. The most unsettling part of the nightmare is undoubtedly Karis running towards his mother, yelling, pleading, yet unable to reach her. The key to this sequence visually is that there is no establishing shot setting the scene, no wide shot depicting the spatial relationship between Karis and his mother. Karis is definitely moving forward as the background changes from shot to shot, but how much forward? He runs towards the camera, making ground quickly and engulfing the frame, making us think that the camera is the mother's POV. 
The next shot, however, places the camera in the exact same position it was before, sitting completely still as we watch her descend the staircase. The next shot of Karis places him back in the middle ground of the frame, still running as he was before. All of these elements combine to masterfully depict the illusion of running in place. The audio, or lack thereof, reinforces this idea, as the two call for each other, yet nothing can be heard. Karis, despite his efforts, is completely helpless, only able to watch his mother die, and nothing more. You killed your mother! Your servant. You left her alone to die! To Shut up! I'll never give you Shut up! Shut up! And that, among the darkness, the demons, and the possessed children, is by far the scariest part. It is so scary that Karis, in the end, would rather sacrifice his own life for an innocent girl he doesn't even know than be a helpless spectator to evil. Ah!